are delighted to have all of you with us this evening. This is our second event for IPPH, that's what we call ourselves. Uh, and we have quite a celebrated group of individuals here tonight. Uh, and I'm just gonna get it started. Uh, and with that, and then I'm gonna introduce someone without whom none of this could have happened, and that is our esteemed mayor, uh, who herself is a history maker. So as we know, 2018 was quite a historic year. It was an unprecedented number of women elected to the House of Representatives. And in fact, we now have, counting all of the, including our non-voting delegates, we have 106 women in the United States House of Representatives, which represents one quarter of that house. And so what we're here at the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History, which was founded for two reasons, to encourage new generations to embrace the practice of politics and public policy, and secondly, to rediscover the history of our city uh, and to make it intriguing and accessible to contemporary audiences. And that's a strong uh, a commitment that our mayor has, uh, and I might add, it will even be and further reinforced here at our own state university, the University of the District of Columbia, which will soon become the home for the DC archives. <laughs> so given our focus, and when we talk about touchstone issues of the day, we are always try to pull upon historical data points to illuminate those conversations because you can understand what the, the issues of the day if you have a stronger context, historical context of those issues. And that's how, as with other Institute of Politics, we're gonna talk about some of the tough issues impacting our country in the here and now, but we will always uh, imbue the conversation with reflections and insights about our history, particularly the history of Washington, D.C., but that is also reflective of the history of our nation because there would not be a Washington, D.C. were there not a new nation that needed a new capital, and we do thank the state of Maryland in part for allowing us to exist. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to... Before I introduce our, 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 our mayor, who will then, they will then have our moderator for the evening, just to give you a big picture view of tonight. And I should begin by saying, we are very blessed this evening uh, to have with us, uh, among our very special guests, a, a great many members who are members of our University of the District of Columbia Board of Trustees. You guys have been terrific. Uh, and they show up faithfully for everything, just about. Uh, and, uh, but, but I have my notes and, uh, <laughs> oh, well, you know, Brenda Atkinson, Willoughby, and I were talking about which parts of the body were falling apart. <laughs> but at any rate, may I ask all the members of the University Board of Trustees to please stand. Thank you all for your support. And, and, I'm, and one such member of the University Board of Trustees uh, is also a founding member of the Senior Advisory Committee that guides everything that we do, and that's Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis. Thank you, Charlene. And we have with us Dean April Massey. And we have the chair of our, since we're talking about politics, the chair of our poli sci department with us tonight, Sheila Harmon Martin. Thank you, Sheila. Oh, the chairman of the board of trustees. Now, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> Thank you very, Gwen is helping me out. Um, <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, so tonight what we have, we will have Michael Steele will serve as our moderator. I think all of you know Michael Steele. Uh, he is a, he is a, for those of you who are wedded to MSNBC, <laughs> you see him on there all the time as a political analyst. He does occasionally do comedic relief on HBO with Bill Maher. I guess discussing politics is a form of comedy, is it not? Uh, and, 
And uh, he was also the chairman of the Republican National Committee, lieutenant governor from the state of Maryland. But we in the District of Columbia claim him. He, uh, he grew up in Petworth, Washington. So. We also have with us tonight uh, a very, another individual from the great state of Maryland. Uh, she was the congresswoman from the 8th District, which was historic in and of itself. She's a Republican who was a great friend of the District of Columbia. She can't win in a district where almost always a Democrat is the person who wins. She did it from 1987 to 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, Connie Morella. And then we have, to put it in historical context, somebody who is the head of the Women's uh, Department of Women's Studies at the Trinity Washington University. Now, folks, for those of you here in Washington, D.C., that is a very significant university that has produced some extraordinary women in our society today, one of whom happens to be the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jamie Parlan. But as I said, all of this happens because we have inspired leadership that has been wonderfully supportive of us. Uh, and that inspired leadership is in the person of our mayor. She's historic in the sense that she's one of the few people who has won twice in the District of Columbia. It's a tough city. I keep telling her I was a lot taller when I took the job. <laughs> But, and the first time a woman has been able to cement that kind of power with an extraordinary re-election. Ladies and gentlemen, our own Mayor Muriel Bowser. Well, good evening, everybody. Let's hear it for our Mayor Sharon Pratt. Give her a big round of applause. Thank you, please, please. And uh, I just, she's a tough act to follow now and following her mayor royalty, but I want to thank Sharon for her visionary leadership in being the founding director and having the vision for this institute uh, and having this institute's home here at the University of the District of Columbia. Thank you, Sharon, for, for all that you do for us in the city. Uh, I was reminded, and sometimes we get away from our history and we don't remember that uh, Sharon was one of the first women, if not the first woman to be elected the mayor of a major city in the United States of America. And when I was elected just a few years ago, there were like five black women uh, who were mayors of major cities. Uh, and in just a few years, in five years time, that number has really ballooned. And so now there is an African-American uh, who is the mayor of New Orleans, the mayor of Atlanta, soon to be the mayor of Chicago. Uh, and so we can see how women's leadership has really taken huge steps um, in the year since uh, Sharon was elected. And I think that our nation and certainly our cities will be better for it. Uh, and now we are in a, just an awesome time in our city as well. I'm very proud and we should all be proud of the progress that we have made as a city, but we are all called, especially now, uh, to preserve and celebrate the history of Washington, D.C. because it is fleeting. Uh, and if we are not intentional about it, there will be uh, people who live in our city, who are born in our city and raised in our city, who don't know the history of that city. And, and that would be a terrible thing. I was reminded, I was at a meeting uh, in, uh, in Ward 1 a couple years ago now. Uh, and I saw a, a gentleman walk in, an elderly, distinguished gentleman, in a suit, and I said, I recognize him. And then I, I looked closely because he was at a distance, and I realized that it was Sterling Tucker. And I didn't know why he was at, at, at the meeting. I didn't, I looked through the agenda to try to figure it out and make the connection to why I was at the meeting. Uh, but then what I realized is that no one in the room knew who he was except me. And so that was a lesson to me uh, that I am in a, um, a very unique position. 
having been born and raised here, uh, getting to be mayor at this time and at this time in my life where I could serve two terms, maybe three, uh, and focus, maybe, never know, uh, and be able to, to kind of stand in the breach. And I knew that when I ran for mayor, um, that there may not be people running or running again who had that perspective and would be able to make the mark that we can make in the city right now. Uh, and so I knew that I would do all that I could um, to make sure that we were preserving that history. We've started a number of things, and this institute is certainly uh, chief among them, uh, including having a series of statues that will be placed in our city. We started with the Marion Barry statute. Councilmember McDuffie moved a piece of legislation so that we will continue to recognize uh, very significant African Americans who have contributed to our city's uh, history. Uh, we, we've also put down our marker right here at the university for the DC archives. If you uh, visit our archives, uh, you would not be very proud. You would think that we were a people who didn't pre want to preserve all the great things that have happened in our government and in our, in our city. Uh, and so with the cooperation, and I want to thank the board of directors here at the university, uh, we will be able to make a significant investment that will allow the university uh, to improve uh, many of its facilities and its offerings to students and staff. So it's a win-win uh, for the archives and for UDC, and we're very, very proud of that. Uh, and with this institute and Sharon's focus on uh, have it to, having it be a very relevant, um, intellectually vigorous uh, study uh, here and one that is engaging residents from all eight wards of the District of Columbia, I know that we are on the right path to preserving the very interesting uh, and intriguing, as you say, politics uh, and history of Washington, D.C. Uh, and I am just really delighted that uh, I don't, I, I know he's ran in Maryland, but he is indeed from Ward 4 in Petworth. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in, in welcoming uh, really uh, one of our a very fresh voice in the Congress of the United States. Uh, and I know you probably are just like me, glued to all the politics shows and watching these women uh, step in, freshmen in the Congress. You know, many times people think of that as a very insignificant um, starting point. And these women have turned it into a very powerful tool for all of us. So I want to uh, just appreciate uh, what Congresswoman Presley is doing, um, not just for her residents, um, but for all of us. So I wanted to be here, uh, even just for the beginning, to say thank you um, to the Institute. I think this is the second event, and I'm looking forward to many, many more dis significant discussions about how we move our city forward together, but celebrate our wonderful past. Thank you. This woman here has uh, turned a lot of heads. I know she turned a lot of heads uh, on my side of the aisle in her run for the United States Congress. Uh, they call her a star member of the freshman class uh, of the women of the 116th Congress. She is, but she was also uh, a star in her great state of Massachusetts. She won that historic 7th Congressional District uh, race this past fall. That seat that she sits in was held by former Speaker Tip O'Neill and former President John F. Kennedy. Not, not bad for high heels. <laughs> Congresswoman Presley, uh, Congresswoman Presley serves on the Financial Services Committee and the Oversight and Reform Committee. Uh, and it is with a great deal of pleasure and honor that IPBH welcomes uh, the star, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna President. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to dig a little bit deeper to my, uh, my friend here to the right, she is uh, someone who I've admired for many, many years and had the privilege of working with uh, when I was both a county chairman 
in Prince George's County and state chairman for the Maryland Republican Party. Congresswoman Morella was appointed a founding member of the Montgomery County Commission for Women. She served 16 years as a member of Congress representing the 8th Congressional District, uh, which was not just a leaning Democratic district, it was a Democratic district. <laughs> Uh, while serving in the House, she was at one time the chair uh, of the, uh, for the Oversight Committee for the District of Columbia. Former Congresswoman Morales served as co-chair of the Congressional Delegation to the 1995 UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. And here's one of the very special uh, treats uh, that, I, that I've always appreciated about the, the Congresswoman. Uh, I remember having a conversation with uh, former Speaker uh, Newt Gingrich uh, about the Congresswoman. And he said he learned very quickly to let Connie be Connie <laughs> and let her do whatever she wanted to do in the House. But he had one, one requirement. He said, you can do whatever you want. It's just that on that day when you vote for Speaker, that's the only vote I need you to give me. She was her own person and has been, uh, and she's a dear friend. And, and I didn't give him and that he vote. Didn't give it to her. I him. No, she didn't. <laughs> No, she didn't. No, she didn't. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Congress for the Thank you. Dr. Jamie Pilot is Director of Women's Studies and Associate Professor at Trinity Washington University. Trinity Washington University is the alma mater of many of the celebrated women uh, that we know, uh, including Speaker Pelosi. And she brings uh, a very unique uh, perspective and insight to the conversation because she can give us context. She can put, put uh, the present in, in context with the past and give us some sense of what it may look like down the road. And I'm actually going to start with you in a moment. Uh, what I want to do, though, is I want to set the stage this way so we can appreciate why these women are not just special and unique, but why their leadership has been uh, and is so important. So right now, there are 127 women in the United States Congress. 23% of those 535 seats are, are filled by women. 25% uh, of those 100%, uh, 25% uh, represents the, the Senate, right? And the rest is in the House. Uh, statewide elected of, uh, executive officers, uh, there are 86 women hold statewide elective executive offices across the country. 46 are Democrats, 38 are Republicans, two are nonpartisan, all right? So that, that's at the executive level. When you look at other elective offices, for example, uh, Attorney General, seven women, Secretary of State, 11, State Treasurer, Chief Financial Officer, 10. Now folks, this is out of the 50 states, okay? State Comptroller, three. State Auditor, 10. Public Utilities Commissioner, one. Commissioner of Lands, two. Agriculture Commissioner, one. Insurance Commissioner, one. In our state legislatures in 2019, 2,126, or 28 percent of the 7,000 state legislators in the United States are women. The numbers tell, I think, a very important story. And so, Professor, I want to start with you. What, what do the numbers say about the journey thus far? Uh, when you look at, for example, the number of women in the Congress uh, back in around 1917, I believe the number was like 3%. Uh, today, that number, as we know, is 23%. Uh, what's your, your sense of the progress that's been made, and what does it tell you about where we're going, particularly in light of what happened in 2018? Keeping in mind, remember the year the woman back in, was it 1994, 92? Um, and then you look at that trajectory and it seemed to plateau a little bit. And now we've got this, this next uh, upward projection. What's your take on things right now? Well, I, I think I have to, oops, sorry. So I used to just talk to you in the classroom, sorry. Um, I'm Jamie Pilon. I'm from Trinity Washington University. And it's a privilege to be amongst uh, two very uh, Honorable Congresswoman, and then uh, all, all the people that have uh, made this happen tonight, including both Mayor Pratt and Mayor Bowser, as well as um, Michael Steele, are all uh, game changers uh, in everything that we know. So it's a big issue to be here. Um, I, I can't not start to answer that question without saying we have to say what happened in 2016. 
for the first time we had a woman win the Democratic ticket uh, for president. Right. Um, and then won the majority of the votes. Did not win the Electoral College, but won that. And then two months later, we had the largest women's march um, that was fueled by Toronto Burke seven years earlier and then got refueled um, by the Me Too movement. And with that, you have two years later the largest number of elected people in Congress that happen to be women and the most diverse Congress we've ever elected in the history of the United States. And historically, yeah, the, the rule of thumb has always been that it has been the Caucasian male that decides for everyone. And now what you're seeing is representatives, if the electorate is going to change, then, mm -hmm. then, then, so are, then, then so are the representatives. And those representatives now look more like their constituents and are thinking more about those issues. Women are at the forefront of voting. Women are at the forefront of making those changes. And there's a lot of grassroots people doing a lot of things behind the scenes that make that propel women to vote. Women vote more than men and have for over 30 years. And I'll, talk, I'll stop here or I'll talk about a trend, but there was a big change that happened. We were 3% from 71. We were 3% of Congress from 71 until about 1991. And there was a lot that went on in 1991. Uh, we had our first woman mayor, uh, uh, 90. Uh, we had Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, became our first delegate woman. Um, at the same time, Anita Hill was happening. And the numbers jumped from women in Congress from three to six. And then we had a presidential shift, and the numbers went to Congress to 6%. And from that moment in the 90s, that was a pivotal moment, we have had an increase. We went from 6 to 10%, and then every year after that, we have moved up about a percentage to a quarter of a percentage. Now, that's not a lot. I mean, we're really proud of it. I'm, I'm rocking and rolling. This is a thing to celebrate. And it's 23%. But it's 23% that we were coming from 3% less than 30 years ago. And the momentum is... Tremendous. So, what, so for for the the two members, um, that momentum uh, creates its own sense of urgency and its own kind of wave, if you will, uh, that you get to ride. How easy uh, was it for you, Congresswoman, to uh, Morala, to to ride that wave? Uh, at the various points that they were happening and, and be inside of an institution or go inside of an institution that really was not necessarily reflective of that wave. Uh, and, and then for you, uh, Congresswoman Perez, uh, Presley, um, this new wave that you're a part of, uh, where, as it was noted, the freshman women seem to not really give a damn <laughs> that the male institution uh, is what it is um, and seem to be drawing a little bit more outside the lines uh, than uh, maybe uh, members have been doing in the past. And how, what does that say about your class versus your class, uh, which really were kind of sitting there but figured out ways to make it work? Like you said, yeah, Newt came to you, but Newt <laughs> didn't necessarily get what he wanted. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here. I feel like I am part of the Washington area here. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, for two years, I did chair the District of Columbia Committee, and it's an honor to have two women uh, mayors who are here, and Charlene Drew Javis, and members of the board, and, and so I'm very pleased to be. And you, as a matter of fact, Congresswoman Presley, you represent the area where I grew up. And so, had I been there, I'd throw my family would have voted for it. <laughs> but I, I, I'll take it back to, I, I'll take it back a little bit to uh, Abigail Adams when she wrote to John in 1776. And she said, John, remember the ladies, else they will foment such a quiet revolution as will not be undone. 
And I really think that those words said it will not be undone. Well, it's taking us a heck of a long time. And with Anita Hill, we thought we'd made it. And as you said, it plateaued. Nothing more happened until now. And now we've got the women who are running, who are winning. And I would submit that what we've got to do is make sure that those women who ran and lost run again. Because when I think back on my history, my first run up came about, the women's movement put the movement into me when I was trying to get members of the Maryland legislature to sign on to the Equal Rights Amendment, which came, on, which came to Maryland because of uh, 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 Griffith, Martha Griffith from Michigan, who with the discharge petition got it uh, out through both the House and the Senate, and it was signed by President Nixon, if any of you remember that ancient history. So actually, then I began to look at the differences between men and women, jobs, uh, education, couldn't get a credit card without a guy signing for me. You know, all of these kinds of things, and I thought, you know, I need to have a seat at the table or I might be on the menu. And so then I decided to run for office. So it was a women's movement that put the movement into me, but I lost my first race. 1974. Just think about the fact that I was running as a Republican. I was one of those Matthias Rockefeller Republicans. I was running as a Republican, and it was a year that, that uh, Nixon was pardoned by Ford, and no Republicans, no new Republicans were elected. But what I say to young women, uh, and young men, but young women particularly, <coughs> run again. No guts, no glory. Don't give up. Obama, Bush, uh, Clinton, they all lost elections, but they ran again and, and succeeded. So how have things changed? 24 women when I was elected in 1986. 50-50, Republican, Democrat. Two in the Senate, 50-50, one Republican, one Democrat. Uh, now, the numbers have soared, comparatively, that is. And I would also lament, Michael, that when I look at the statistics, I find that Two-thirds of the new women are, Republic, are, are Democrats. So what I'm saying is this is the extinction of a current Republican Party as it is if they don't do something to change the platform, to en encourage more people to run, to make it the big tent as it once was. Yeah. So, I, I, so what I would say is to women, let's keep going. No guts, no glory run again, make, look at the women running for president. When Hillary Clinton became the candidate, people said, what is it? she doesn't look like a president. Well, what does a president look like? Well, now we're going to see a lot of them. So we're going to know what a president looks like. So. Thank you. Okay. Well, so I'm last. And I'm the granddaughter of a Baptist preacher, so you know how this is going to go in terms of brevity, okay? Um, <laughs> so you did it to yourself. So. Um, <laughs> no, but but uh, you know, thank you all for being here and for caring about um, our democracy and our government and your community. And this is my first time here at this incredible campus. It will not be my last. All right, so I'm going to try to answer this, your question uh, succinctly. So I have to begin at the beginning. Um, more than anything in the world that you can learn about me in a Google or Wikipedia search, um, more than any comma or title that has accompanied my name, uh, what defines me is that I am my mother's child. May she rest in power. And my mother, I'm an only child, my mother gave me my roots, my wings, uh, she was a tenants' rights organizer for the Urban League of Chicago. She was a social worker. Um, for as long as I can remember, in addition to all the, the jobs that she held to try to make ends meet, she let me know early on that there was a difference between your job and your work. And her work was that of advancing uh, and uplifting community. So I learned early on about the power of organizing and mobilizing I participated in my first tenants' rights march in her arms at three months old, and uh, worked on my first campaign to elect the first African-American mayor of Chicago, which is where I'm originally from, Harold Washington. Um, and so, you know, there are many reasons, my story is not a unique one, but, but it is my story, being reared in a single parent household, my father, who is a brilliant man, who has gone on to um, be a 
college professor and a published author, but he was in the throes of addiction in and out of the criminal justice system. Um, I'm a survivor of a decade of childhood sexual abuse and later campus sexual assault. All things I'm very transparent about because they are my truth, but I don't have the monopoly on them. But I say all that to say that there were many reasons my mother and I felt small and invisible, but on election day, she made sure I knew that we were powerful and I believed her. So there was a seed planted in me very early on uh, where my mother made sure I knew that not only did we need to engage in symbiotic partnership with government, we could not lay the work squarely on the shoulders of or at the feet of government, that this was work we had to do together. Um, but that I never needed to ask permission to leave, which is why years later, I could challenge a, a 20 year incumbent, um, which there was no, it was no indictment against my predecessor. Um, you know, I'm grateful for his 20 years of service, um, but I believe that I would ask different questions and even if we were likely to vote the same, we would lead differently. And that is why I ran. And prior to my running for Congress, a lot of people don't know this because the narrative is sort of like, you know, we just descended out of the sky. I I've been on my grind for a long time. Uh, please don't be fooled by the baby face. I'm 45 and, um, and I served on the Boston City Council for eight years. And prior to that, I was an aide on the federal level for 16 years, four on the House to Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy II, young Joe's dad, and 11 for United States Senator John Kerry. So I was an aide on the federal side for 16 years before I ran for and became uh, the first woman of color elected to the Boston City Council. Okay, so let me, let me get to your, your question. I just want to contextualize uh, this because... Um, we don't often get to do this in, this, in the sound bites of, of the public, public narrative here. I ran for the Boston City Council because I believe in leadership parity. Not so that we can say how progressive and inclusive we are. Not for contrived moments of kumbaya. I believe in leadership parity because when you have a diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought around the table, around policy and decision-making tables, the uh, questions asked are different. The issues raised are more robust. The solutions are more innovative and more enduring. Everyone was talking about the boys. No one was talking about the girls. Um, I continued to open up my home and my heart. Girls would uh, say, I think I'm pregnant. Can I take a test at your home? I just came out to my parents. I'm queer. They kicked me out. Can I stay with you? My uncle is molesting me. Can you help me? My boyfriend is pressuring me to have sex. What should I do? And I said, we are failing the girls. There is no gender specific and responsive programming and protocol. This is not a contest for whether or not we are our brother's keeper or our sister's keeper. It's an and, it's not an or. And I wanted to be at the table to ask that question. Our first budget cycle, when I asked about the girls for every department and agency that came before us, monosyllabic responses. By that next budget cycle, they came with binders because they knew someone was asking the question. And that is the true power of representation and a diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought around the table. So I served on the Boston City Council for eight years, was a top vote getter for three consecutive elections. If y'all don't know Boston, politics is the number one contact sport. <laughs> and then um, I ran for Congress and people thought it audacious that someone who had been a top vote getter for three consecutive elections in the city of Boston 70% uh, of Boston is in this district. So I had earned the confidence of this electorate. I was proven, I was no novice. A district that is 53% people of color, 40% foreign born, and almost 40% single female headed household and the nerve of me. <laughs> and furthermore, Massachusetts for all of its progressive bona fides, in the 230 year history of our congressional delegation, never a member of color, ever. So as I close, after you hear all of that, you'll know why I have issue with this framing of a wave. If there is a wave, we weren't riding it, we created it. And so I get nervous when people talk about 
the year of the woman and black girl magic and all of this, I would never give short shrift to my magic. But what I know about is black woman work. And I have been putting it in. So I, I think ultimately this is a testament of the electorate, uh, the power of our voices and asking different questions. And you can't vote for the best candidate if they're not on the ballot uh, to the gentle lady's point, which is why we need to run. So in the running, the running is one thing. Um, it's, as I think any candidate will tell you, the ebb and flows of campaigns um, tend to be a life unto themselves, and they tend to create a bubble uh, for candidates that um, often pop once uh, they take that oath of office. Uh, what, what has been the transition for women uh, versus the transition for men um, that, uh, that we see, the types of pressures, the types of expectation that are placed on women uh, in elective office. What, you know, from your various perspectives, what, uh, what do you see and what should women be aware of um, as, they, as they step into this space for the first time? They need to uh, know that they're going to have to stand up for their rights to be taken seriously. That's the one thing I have found that, um, th that was a, a liability for women. Uh, I can remember, in, I was in the state legislature for eight years before I went to the federal uh, legislature. In the state legislature, just as an example, at a committee meeting, uh, the chairman would ask a question or be a speaker, and so I'd raise my hand, and then it would be, and so Connie, and then I would give my response, thank you very much. Delegate Jones, the mayor, uh, what do you think? Said the well, same thing I said. And, the, and then the response was, excellent, let's put that in the record to make sure that it is taken. What I have learned, if that continues, and sometimes it does in little ways, a little less, is to say, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so glad that Delegate Jones said the very same thing I did. And so we, let's make sure that we do put it in the record and give attribution or something on that idea. The point is, I think we have to, in our own way, with, uh, and women have an ability to do that, is to be able to get the point across very nicely, very seriously, and follow through. So I think that's been it. And I think it's a cultural thing. And I, so therefore, I don't think we're going to find the answer immediately. We've got to right. keep, that, keep that moving and encourage women to let them know that they can do something. We find women don't run for office because they don't have confidence in themselves. I don't have 45 PhD degrees, so why can I run for Congress? Well, look at, I get somebody in my area who's running for president, you know? He was in Congress, he's running for president, right. So men can take those strides, and so women need to be able to do it. So I think being taken seriously, making sure you do your homework, uh, and so you can, <laughs> You, you can dance with Fred Astaire with heels and do a terrific job and get the same pay he got. That's right. You remember she did That's that. right. <laughs> uh, professor? Well, I think, I think the most important um, hurdle, and I think we need to look at this by looking at the statistics, is that a majority of the women that won Congress this year um, beat their incumbents. And that's what most women, and I'm not either of the uh, honorable people sitting to each side of me, but that is the biggest issue, and they did that this time. And I think that's about creating space. I think that's about creating space, and women have done that, and they will continue to do that. And I think that the idea that, I like I liked what you said about not riding the wave, but creating the wave. I think you're going to see uh, a cooperation across the aisle. I think you're going to see um, a lots of ascription that women won't do that. And I think you're going to see a space where women can have dialogue and disagree. And it's going to be even more useful because the key issues that women care about, that they listen to their constituents, are going to be there. And that's what prompted most of the votes to happen anyway. But it is important to note that they beat their incumbents, and that's a big deal. Well, I'm sitting next to it. So. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Uh, okay, so question. Uh, 
question was, um, what do they need to know for women that might run or something? Yeah, okay. yeah. The, the idea is, you know, what, what has, from your experience coming in, doing that run, what have you learned since you got there to the Congress that, you know, now the bloom is off the rose, so to speak, and you're inside the room and inside the game, it's a different, it's a different stage. Okay, well, how, does, how does a woman respond in that space? Well, I appreciate what the gentle lady was speaking to, just in terms of those, what I would consider uh, non-malicious microaggressions that occur. Um, you know, people are just not even aware. It's not malice, it's just a lack of, of perspective. And so I think it's important that we challenge and call those things out, you know, when they do occur, those sorts of uh, double standards and biases. Um, I want to just say something to the electorate. What I have found very challenging is that when I was elected to the Boston City Council as the first woman of color to serve on that body in that time in its 100 year history, in the years that followed, five more women of color joined the city council. So we, it's a 13 member body and, um, and, and we've achieved incredible parity, great strides. But people always compared the women to each other. And this is not what happens with our male colleagues. And you know, I have to, and so you know, people either expect us to be um, uh, in complete and perfect synchronicity and lockstep with, with um, anyone who has ovaries um, which I, I find frustrating because we are thought leaders, we are policy makers, we are elected officials. This is not a sorority. Um, and so we are going to differ. And what I'm appealing to the electorate to do is to please give us each the runway and the bandwidth to uniquely govern as ourselves, to not draw these comparisons because it is a complete double standard that's not happening with our colleagues. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to just, uh, that I, I was remiss in mentioning in my sort of story is that I began as an intern for the very con the seat that I sit in. And so it is game changing. I was an unpaid intern working three part time jobs to do that unpaid internship. And I had no problem making that sacrifice because I wanted to develop me so I could develop my community. But we are now paying our interns. And that is going to be game changing in diversifying the pipeline as to the inner workings of government. Um, it's rare that someone can just run on the federal level. We both came from uh, the state and the local level. So we need to encourage people to run for school committee, for city council um, and the like. And then the last thing I would say uh, is that um, we need to diversify who our vendors are. And the reason um, in terms of who, because you said women need to have that confidence, that's true, but they need pollsters, they need uh, people that know how to write a field plan, people that know how to write a communications plan. So everyone has been very focused on how do we diversify the bench of who's on the ballot, but we need to be just as intentional in diversifying the ballot of the people behind the people. Um, because it is particularly if in order for us to achieve parity, we are going to have to primary some people. That's a fact. If we keep going the way we are going, and I know this is unpopular, we, it will take us 40 years to achieve parity in the halls of Congress. And so you're go we, need to, um, we need to make sure that we're building that bench on the other side as well. I just wanted to underscore that. Okay, so but, but more to the point, okay, so you've done, done all that. Yeah. So what happens when you get in the room? Yeah. And, and so Congresswoman Morales states that, you know, the individual she was dealing with had, you know, said to her at, in the day, look, you know, that's great, Connie, thank you. Yeah. And then, oh, yes, delegate, Senator, Congressman, thank you. Yeah. What have you found on the city council, from the city council to the halls of Congress, once you're in the room and at the table, um, as a woman, as a woman of color, is there a difference? Are you, do you see a difference in how your colleagues, men and women, mm -hmm. who are part of the established order of things, treat someone like you coming in the door fresh? Well, the dynamics of, of my seat are very different because I did unseat someone. Um, and so that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I'm sensitive to that. It is uncomfortable for a lot of people. But by and large, I feel that I've been embraced with, with open arms. More of what I've struggled with um, it's important to note that even though we set ourselves at a higher bar because we are Congress, we're just a microcosm of society. So the same challenges that dog me outside of the Capitol dog me within the halls of Congress. 
people making quick assumptions about me, not always taking the time and being intentional to get to know me. Um, I do think women govern differently. I do think we um, work intentionally to foster uh, empathy. We work cooperatively. We bring our lived experience. Uh, we're collaborative. Um, and so uh, what I've been frustrated by is throughout the campaign, I was dogged by uh, characterizations of my running an identity politics campaign, which was very, very hurtful. Um, because it is obvious that I am black and a woman and unapologetically proud to be both. However, that is not the totality of my identity. Now, if you were a former iron worker and you ran for Congress and said you're gonna fight for workers' rights, no one would say that was identity politics. So why if I say I'm going to fight, not exclusively, but I'm going to spotlight the challenges of black Americans or women or marginalized communities Am I accused of identity politics? And so um, I did feel there were some that had the residue of the campaign that I, I had to work to uh, dismantle. But this is what I know. At the core of all things politic is relationship. So our incoming class is huge. It's 91 members. Congress is a very big place. And I'm being intentional about reaching out to people within my caucus, across the aisle. Um, I'm working with some Republicans right now to uh, get a congressional uh, gold medal for Willie O'Ree, the Jackie Robinson of hockey, um, who a lot of people don't a, a lot of people don't know, right? And so I just look to people who were leading in the areas that I want to lead and have an impact on as a legislator. You know, that's the main thing. We are there. I wanna, I wanna make, I wanna author legislation, pass legislation, because the inequities and disparities in my district, and I'll close with the seventh congressional. From Roxbury to Cambridge, life expectancy drops by 30 years and median household income by $50,000. Now that didn't just happen in the, ether, in the ether. That's because of credit invisibility. That's because of underbanking. That's because of redlining. That's because of unequal access to the GI Bill. That's because of well-meaning laws with unintended consequences and because of discriminatory laws. So I wanna legislate and you can't do that if you don't foster relationship. And, and that's what was really underscored for me is that I have to be intentional about building. People, we don't know each other. Right. So. Yeah, Go ahead. I can pick up on that. That's one of the difficulties, is that the members of Congress don't know each other. And that's why I hope all of you will get to meet more people, new people. Um, when I teach a class, I always say before you leave, make sure you have the name and the contacts of the people who are with you. You never know when you might need them. You never know when you want to share something that's comfortable. Members of Congress, I'm, um, I'm on a board, the Franklin Center, which take members of Congress once a year overseas, bipartisan. And it's amazing how many of them never really knew each other. But by, when they come back after learning about uh, the geopolitics of it, they know that so-and-so has a kid and so-and-so, you know, grew up in the same area. Sure. And then they can work, they can That's disagree, right. but they can work together. And so I think the knowing people helps with civility. And I, I, you are in a great position to see that, so, and I've seen the changes yeah. in terms of the civility. George Washington, when he was 15 years old, wrote rules of civility and decent behavior. And the first rule he wrote was, when in the company of others, act with recognition and respect for those who are present. Yes. Well, simple as that. Yes. And if we do that, we can get a lot more from them. We can listen, we can learn, we can lead. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So is, is there, because you triggered a, a question for me. Uh, Congresswoman Presley, is there a difference between uh, how we view women when it comes to executive leadership versus legislative leadership? In other words, I'll make you my state rep, I'll make you my city council member, but not president, governor, we only have nine, um, mayors, the number's a little bit better, 
Is there, is there a difference uh, in, in that regard? And I have a follow-up on that, which may be a little bit hot, so we'll just save that for a moment. But let's start. Let's, Ask them that hot question. Let's start. Let, let's start. And, and you, know, I, you know, Professor, you can sort of give us some context about maybe some of the, the attitudes uh, that, that Americans have uh, across the country um, from region to region, state to state, about uh, the, how they view women. Uh, and whether or not they do distinguish between electing, um, you know, a, a mayor Pratt versus Councilwoman Pratt. Sure. I mean, the numbers are smaller, um, but the the most important uh, aspect that both uh, Congresswomen have referred to is the stronger the state legislation is, the better women have and have produced uh senators and, and congressional members. And that's been true in the last 30 years. The stronger we are in the state, so Congressman's saying she started here, she started on the council, she moved forward, she looked at her community. The more in touch with her community is, the stronger the state is, the more she's going to pull those constituents in to vote. Um, to ask me your question. What so, so the question is, do, do voters distinguish right. between a woman running for an executive leadership role which is a very different leadership role. You're making decisions sure. in the moment right there. The mayor has to decide yes or no in this moment. The legislator, the legislator has to go consult maybe and get, get yes. support and momentum behind their legislation. Um, and so the roles are very different because the results and the impacts are different. Do voters make that kind of distinction? And to the members, I wanna see, ask you as, as a follow-up to that, have you seen that? Do you get that sense when you talk to voters that they look at you differently depending on the office you're running for? Well, again, women, women lead women's, women's ways of thinking and their intelligence is, is not measurably different. Um, women lead well, women, women lead teams better, but the ascription is different. So, um, you know, uh, we know the double standards exist. And so the higher the stakes, the more scared people get. Um, and I don't mean just all people, I mean particular populations of people that tend to not vote for women. Um, women tend to vote for women. Um, and that has put women into office. I challenge that point, but go ahead, you can. <laughs> Otherwise we'd be talking to President Clinton. I, well, I, I understand that. That's, I understand. That was the point I was gonna make a little bit controversial. Right? <laughs> just cause. Last, last I checked, 52% of white educated females voted for the man in the office, That's not true. the woman in the office. That's true. That's true. And I put the emphasis on educated, so. No, that's, that's true. That's true. Um, the, the, vote, the vote to get women in office. Now, is there internalized sexism? Absolutely. Do we get nervous about that? Absolutely. But it's Why? This, Why do you think that is? Oh, it's the ascription. It's the internalized sexism. It's it's uh, we buy into what's said outside our group about our group, and uh, it's it's uh, part of the whole system of, of of the institutional ways that women and those underserved, um, including everybody sitting here, get marginalized. I mean, everybody in this room. Mm -hmm. The the ascription that you're aberrant, that you're not going to think clearly, that you're not going to take care of what I need to take care of, that if you're not representative of the dominant group, that you will, in fact, maybe affect the dominant group. Um, it, but isn't that ironic that when she was in the other house, meaning her home, she got the husband up, the kids ready to go out the door, she did a full-time job all the length, come home, fix dinner, and paid the bills on time, and yet she can't introduce a piece of legislation or manage the picking up of trash. For the city. I'll what? I think, um, you know, it's really important that we, with the electorate, sort of shift the paradigm, and I see it happening incrementally. Um, the reason why I don't like that framer of a wave is that it gives short shrift to the innovation, to the sweat equity. And it allows us to either be characterized as an anomaly or a trend. And both of those do a disservice to the work that has been put in. And that makes it easier for people to marginalize uh, these victories. And so they, they're seen as one-offs. 
Sure, that person did it, but you can't. Um, you know, this isn't winnable because of this, this, and this. Um, the other thing is we have to diversify the narrative of female candidate running. We need uh, mature women to run. We need queer women to run. We need, you know, two mommy households to run. We need to diversify uh, women living with disabilities because if single moms, when I ran for the city council the first time, I can't tell you the number of women that said, you know, you are single, you are unmarried, and you are childless, and I don't think that you can relate to my struggle. Now, you know, I was a, a caregiver to my mother who was battling leukemia. Yeah, may she rest in power. She's since transitioned. Um, I had left a very secure government job and working for Senator Kerry to run, was uh, paying my own mortgage. No one else was carrying me on their health insurance. And, and so I just came up with this little ditty on the campaign trail. I said, okay, so I will be married to my job and you can be my baby, all right? Because, but my point is, I'm, I'm making light of the fact that the electorate only embraced a single narrative about female candidates, and it was that they were married and they had kids, and so they would say to me, well, you didn't go through Boston Public Schools, and you don't have kids in Boston Public Schools, is if I would be any less committed to those children, those are our children. And so I think it's important that we embrace a diversity of narrative of female candidate, uh, which hopefully will bolster the electorate's confidence um, and more candidates about what is possible. One of the biggest internal debates in my campaign was about whether or not I could keep my hair in braids. Because that was considered a political statement, right? And so now there are so many uh, you know, young women running for a class president in their high school or on their college campuses or thinking about running uh, for elected office that are proudly wearing their hair in ethno-Afrocentric hairstyles, standing in their truth because they believe it is possible because I showed them that it was. So we have to continue to diversify the narrative. Um, I, I think the answer is numbers, numbers. Uh, it, it, I'll take you back with my little anecdotes. Bradwell versus State, a woman who from Illinois wanted to uh, practice in the court. She had law training. She was denied it. She went to the Supreme Court. It became a case called Bradwell versus State. She was ruled against uh, by Judge Bra Justice Bradwell, uh, who was the Chief Justice at the time. He said, due to natural timidity, the proper uh, view of women should be as wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. Well, when you've got that going, That's when right. you have, right, you had almost no women in law school. I remember Pat Schroeder used to say she was the only woman in her law class, and they looked on her like, you're taking a man's place. Now we have women, 52 to 54 percent, going to law school. You now have women judges. Right. It's the same thing with doctors. We need, a, we need more in STEM and in engineering. The more women you have in these spots, the more they're gonna be looked at as <laughs> equal human beings and you're gonna look at their qualities and, and their qualifications and not the fact that they're women. So we need to get more that's women right. in. And that's why I'm glad more women are running for not only Congress, but running for president. Then in the next election, they, there'll be no question about a woman running for president. The viability, yeah. Right, exactly. So I think get them, get them out there, get the numbers. Get the numbers, get the numbers. So what I, before we open it up for some questions, I have one, one last one for, for each of you. And that, that touches on, when you look at you, we opened up, Professor, you opened up talking about the Women's March uh, inaugural weekend and the incredible outpouring uh, of uh, women who um, some will say was responding to the election, yes, but uh, I tend to think there was something else going on there. I think it was, I think there was an awakening, awakening to some degree of not just how that election played out, um, upon, you know, it didn't matter necessarily where you stood at that moment. It was something else going on. What do you think from that moment to this incoming class um, what do you think the statement that women have been saying finally? I mean, it, it, for me, it was the sense of they found their voice. They just, they just got to a point, you know, it's that moment when you, you're, 
you're by yourself, you're reflecting, you just go, that's it, I'm done. I've had enough of this. I've got to do something different. I've got to say something different. Am I right in that sense that for a lot of women in this country, uh, it galvanized in a way? I mean, because I remember thinking the number of women who were there, Republican, Democrat, conservative, progressive, white, black, gay, straight, it was just this cross-section of, of women supported uh, by women uh, that found a voice for women. That's how I interpreted that. And I've seen since that time this steady progression of that voice. Uh, it's, man it's manifested in the, in the vote for sure. But it's also manifested in me too. It's manifested in the response to uh, the, the silent abuse of women and how, again, no more, I found my voice. You're going to jail for what you did to me. You're going to pay for what, you're going, what you did to me. But more importantly, society has to first recognize what you've done to me. And that moment was reflected in the Kavanaugh hearings for me where there was this stark contrast. It's still sort of holding on to the vestiges of the past, sort of the Anita Hill kind of climate, um, where the voice of that woman was, in my view, again, being smothered to some degree by politics. But yet, on the other side of that, women came out stronger, the voice seemed to be louder. Is that an appropriate interpretation? Do you see that trend line, or am I completely <laughs> off base here? What do you think? Okay, I, I think it says you don't have to walk alone. I think the idea of knowing that others feel the way you do, even though you kept it hidden, you did all the so-called right things, but to know that there are others who feel the way you do helps you generate courage to get together. And togetherness, I think, is so critically important. I think groups, when they form, they can make a difference. I would also add another element that I, I know, you know you all know even better than I, social media. Social media is a new phenomenon. It's not that new, but every new, new and nuances come on mm -hmm. all constantly, but it is a way of communicating. And these marches were communicating, physically communicating, and, and how did they get the word? Through social media. So I, that's, uh, that's the way I see uh, the coming together. And I think when it comes together for good reasons, like a communion of each other, I think you can find some results. But they need to follow through, too. That would be my other advice, is follow through, take more steps. Yeah. I would say I saw a huge uh, change in uh, money, and the money uh, helped fuel the emotion, which was tied into key issues that women had been dealing with and given permission to deal with. Uh, $19 million by Republican women, $159 million in the last campaigns by Democratic women, and I don't have the independent number, but that's a lot of money. And um, that's women donations. So I, I think that we have, to, we have to really look at this place that we've, that we've had these moments where we succeeded and then there's usually backlash, and there's always backlash. Whenever we succeed, there's backlash. We're all waiting for the backlash. We always do. Whenever women take two steps forward, we're waiting for the backlash, and it happens. It happens pretty quickly. And for me, the Kavanaugh hearing was that backlash. Um, and that, that, that stung, and it was huge, and it stung all the way around. And because we were watching history repeat itself. Right. And um, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it about race. We couldn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it about anything but what it was really about, and it still didn't go forward. And so we overcome that, we rise up again, we go forward. But what a lot of the social PACs have been doing, especially PACs that support women, women of color, um, is really saying, I mean, I got an email. I got an email, are you gonna run for office? And I kinda went, <laughs> me? And, and I love the, 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 the congresswoman saying like, you know, we need diversity in that. We need mature people running for office. We need queer people running for office. We need young people running for office. Uh, 
new bill to vote <laughs> uh, Sorry to plug <laughs> that for you, you. but, uh, you, so you know, much. I mean, we're, we're giving heed to voice. And when literally somebody says, if you want to run for office, here's the 10 steps how you're going to do it. And push this button and we'll give you information. Social media, of course, Congresswoman, but also opportunity for voice. I think the idea of the single story is, is, is the narrative that, that women know all too well and we're totally dismantling that and recognizing the uniqueness of, of women's contributions, women's ways of knowing, women's ways of leading. And I, I think that there, there is much more to come and I think it's about the amazing hard work that women are doing and that will, they will continue to do to resist the dominant, the dominant um, paradigm. And I think that it's complex. And I think the intersectionality of looking at race yes. and ethnicity and class and sexuality and ability and gender, all those things, women are really tapping into that. And I'll be honest, we, we, have, we have plenty of men that are also being allies to that. And that is helping the cause. Because the, 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 the focus is really the intersection of the oppression of all that together. So for many of our constituents in, in many of these districts, they, they are layers of oppression. So it's like, which one do I claim first? Do I claim my class first? Do I claim my race first? Which, who am I gonna vote for based on who's gonna help me, healthcare? Am, am, I, gonna get, am I gonna get a better, am I gonna, gonna get housing? Who's going to help? So, you know, the mayors deal with this every day, and, and, and they know that. And so uh, I, I think these, the intersectionality of those issues, women are in tune with that. Women have lived that. Men have lived that, if you're not in the dominant group, of course. And so, of course, you're heeding those opportunities. And I, and I think it will continue. I do. Absolutely. Yes, Dr. Yes. Thank you, Professor. I love what you were saying about intersectionality, because... That is what I feel is so different in this moment, is that organizing silos are breaking down. We're no longer allowing them to sort of uh, create a hierarchy of herd, and we sort of pawn off the herd on one community, you know, against another. So the same people that I see at an immigrants' rights rally are the same people I see at a survivors' rights rally are the same people, and then some at criminal justice reform. You know, we're really, and we have to be, I think, intentionally inclusive in our movement building. And it is about movement building. You know, the, the Congresswoman is uh, is better at attributing quotes to the appropriate uh, person. I don't know who said, uh, those who don't study their history are uh, condemned to repeat it. But, you know, these things are, who was it? Do you know who said it? Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but, you know, but these things, okay. Okay, but that these, these things are, um, they are cyclical. And so, Okay, Carter Woodson. Okay, those who do not study their history are condemned to repeat it. So we are re so we are repeating uh, history. So for me, I hearken back to the past. I think what we did is we got away from the blueprint, and the civil rights movement, I think, gave us the blueprint. It's organized. It's mobilized. It's legislate our values. And so now we are back, and this is why I ran for Congress because I think these times demand and require activist leadership. It is not a leadership choice. Um, it is the expectation of this generation. It is a moral imperative. And so it is we have, uh, it's a resurrection of the citizen activist. And that is really the difference and the intersectionality piece, you know, definitely. But as a survivor, I need to just say this. Um, Audre Lorde said, uh, when we liberate ourselves, we liberate others. The power of story. It is so important that we continue to create space. And I think that that's what's happened with survivors who realize that it's no long, it's, it's not our shame. It never was our shame. And we deserve healing and we deserve justice. And sexual harassment and, and sexual assault, these are transcendent issues. I'm gonna tell you, in my time on the Boston City Council, I worked on a lot of third rail uh, controversial issues, getting uh, sex ed into our schools and uh, tackling human trafficking and reforming antiquated laws that upset a lot of people. But ultimately we were successful. But the first time I ever received hate mail was when I disclosed that I was a survivor of campus sexual assault. 
I was called a liar. I was called a whore. I was called attention seeking. And so I have never regretted that because to this day, there is not a room or space I enter that someone does not come up to me and say, thank you for telling your story. That is my story. That is my sister's story. That was my grandmother's story. So I think that uh, this is the reckoning uh, so far as survivors are concerned. And we're going to continue to organize until we get the healing and the justice that we deserve. Yeah. That sort of says it all. <laughs> we, have been, we have been very fortunate this evening to have uh, three powerful women share their voice uh, and, and continue to hold up that light for all of us. Uh, we really appreciate the leadership that you're bringing to the table uh, and the opportunity to sit in this space uh, and to hear a word or two from each one of you. So thank you all. So what we're going to do is take a couple of questions, uh, if you have them from the audience, uh, and then we will uh, complete the evening. So if there are any questions, now's a good chance. If not, then we will be free to, uh, how shall we say, boogie. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I was terribly surprised when I found out that over 52% of white of, of women voted for Hillary. I mean, voted against Hillary. And so, uh, I tend to say that. <laughs> uh, uh, but I was terribly surprised that uh, they actually uh, that she uh, got uh, the majority of women vote. Could you tell me what would change now? Uh, in the next election. There's been a change. I mean, what's going on? Can you tell me why that happened? Anybody? And so I guess the, the nub of that is, do we see women voting differently in 2020 uh, than they did in 2016? Anybody? Professor, what do you think? I think so. Connie? Connie? I, I, I think they will, because I think there were a lot of... I, I supported Hillary as a Republican. I came out early to support Hillary. Because I felt she had the experience, she had the knowledge, uh, and she had the, the credentials and the civility. So, but that aside, I, I think there were a combination of factors in terms of why she lost. She lost because the press paid attention to Trump. But I really do think they gave him too much attention. But there was a touch, my friends, of misogyny in that. Uh, and, and, and some of that came from women. Whether they felt well, you know, right. we've not been able to rise to that point. Maybe we should. Maybe we're not ready for a woman at this point. So that really troubled me. And whenever I talk to women, I particularly push. You know, let's look at the credentials in terms of who's able to serve. There are other reasons why too. Mm -hmm. I mean, email, all that sort of stuff. But uh, I, I do think that women need to look to other women in terms of not being critical about I don't like her earrings or she doesn't smile enough, no. uh, but rather what her credentials are. Uh, I, it's my group you're talking about. So, um, you know, I'm in my 50s. I'm a teacher. <laughs> I voted for Hillary, but, you know, my sisters didn't. And so um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I come from a long line of Republicans from California. I'm not one of them now, um, but uh, that's my history. And so I think we have to really look at people understanding issues, people understanding what they're voting for, why they're voting for it. And if you vote a certain way, you're voting against the very situation you're sitting in. So many people voted against their own issues and, and, and hurting Hurt, losing hurts at this point. At, at this point, it's two years in, it hurts. Um, and I still think there's a lot of work to be done in my group. So I, I'm, I'm really clear about that, and, I, and I'm really clear about the idea of internalized sexism, misogyny, of course. Um, I don't think it's rooted in jealousy. I think it's rooted in the dominant message, and I think that we buy into it, and I think it's the innocuous, microaggressive kinds of regular things that... Everybody gets race, nobody gets gender. So it's like, you know, come on, that, that was just a joke. Uh, that didn't mean that, that didn't mean this, but all those tiny innocuous behaviors that happen every day, street harassment, um, you know, uh, sexting, uh, 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 who's in the classroom, who, 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 who teaches, uh, you know, the uneven table, pay inequity, lesbian baiting, I could just keep going. And all of that we would say, well, that's bad, but it's okay. 
But then if we get to sexual harassment, sexual assault, and that 75% of women in emergency rooms are there because of an intimate partner, or we get to a third of murders are done by an intimate partner, and most of the time that intimate partner is a male, that's bad. But we don't figure out how we get from the left side to the right side, or the right side to the left side, depending on which way you're looking at it. It's not about politics. It's about innocuous micro behaviors that lead to the horrific. And I think that we, as women, really have to understand what we want from those running in office. And I'm, you're sitting next to two people who were so clear about their vision and so connected to their constituents that they made relationships with them. And I think women are doing that better. And I, I think we need to continually resist the dominant paradigm and figure out how, as women, we can vote for issues that affect everybody in our community. We've got one here. This microphone. Right here. <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to go before this young lady, but I would like to know if Miss Ayana has, Congresswoman, has uh, considered. You can call um, me sister, Congresswoman. Sister, Congresswoman, <laughs> has considered <laughs> voting for HR 51 the dominant uh, civil rights issue of our time, which is D.C. State. Of course. Are you a co-sponsor? Yeah, I think that's one of the first things I signed on to. Where's my team? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, that would be a yes. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Give me a hat. <laughs> yes. Thank you. High five. Yes, Hi. How are you guys doing? Yeah. So my name is Tamara, and I'm part of the Beta Iota chapter at the University of the District of Columbia, Fort Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So I'm always on the prowl for revolutionary, dynamic divas. And clearly the panel was full with them today. I was wondering, as a single mom of two children, is there any charge or any motivation or any paths that you have encountered or any type of rearing and training that you can provide for the young sisters out here today that who would like to, you know, follow this pattern. Like, it appears that, you know, if you have the right people rallying around you, if you have a lot of training, you could do it. Like, what is the charge? What were the steps that you used to get where you're at? And how can you empower the sisters back here, whether they're sisters or, you know, any other minority? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me uh, evoke the spirit of one of your sorors. For those of you that don't know, I have the distinction of being in the first office of Shirley Chisholm. Yes, ma'am. In Longworth, 1108. It's an incredible story. I'll share with you some other time. But, um, but you know, I would say a couple of things. Uh, what I say to young women is that you have to run before you run. And what I mean by that is, I think that, you know, based on the increased representation and now more, more, more women want to run for office than ever before based on popular culture, what they're seeing in representation. Um, when I used to visit schools and say, raise your hand if you want to run for office, I mean, no one would raise a hand. And now multiple hands uh, go up. But I'll also tell you, when I visit Boston Public Schools as a Boston City Counselor, and I represented 670,000 people, and I would ask the students, uh, do any of you know how big the city of Boston is? And the boys would shoot up their hands and they would say, two million, a hundred thousand, and not a girl would raise her hand. And at the end, they would all come up to me with their guests. Now, why is that? Because it starts early, where girls become women who don't operate with a level of self-agency and entitlement. We allow the word entitlement to be co-opted. Entitlement is not a bad thing. You can have an entitlement to be heard, but girls become women who are afraid to get it wrong. And that's why so many women don't run, to the general lady's point. They're saying, I don't have 45 degrees. I don't have all the answers. They're afraid to be wrong. The data says it takes, on average, a minimum of seven people to convince a woman to run for office. How many do you think it takes to convince a man? Himself. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 run before, so let me get back to run before you run. When I ran for the Boston City Council, I said, I'm running to save our girls, girls that don't even know they need saving. And people said, well, go run a nonprofit, that's not the job of municipal government. 
I could stand firmly in that. And I, I knew that that was an agenda that would resonate with many, and not just mothers, and not just daughters, but that's because any organization dedicated to development, advancement, and health and wellness of women and girls, I had volunteered for, served on the board, I had done the work. I knew the issue. And I think a lot of young people are obsessing about the position when they're not clear on the purpose. So I knew my purpose. I wanted to save girls. And so I followed the work. Like I said, my mother told me there's a difference between your job and your work. So I followed the work. And I think some young people are trying to skip steps. So, you know, crystallize your purpose and work backwards. Don't obsess about what position uh, to run for. So, you know, you're here at 8.30 on a Tuesday. Okay, so you're already in community and doing the work, yes. all right? So thank you for your contribution. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh come on. Oh, well, well. You have the floor, madam. In terms of, of what recommendations I would have for young women who want to run or thinking about running for office, have a purpose. Why do you want to run? I remember Barbara Mikulski, she wanted to change the zoning law in, the, in Baltimore. Right. For me, it was women. You know, I wanted to make some changes in that regard. After you have a purpose, have a passion for it. Right. Really, you really have a passion. Yeah. And then you develop your plan. And your yeah. plan also involves reaching out to other people, to groups, get to know people, contact them, join groups. And then you need patience and perseverance. That's my Well, we will, we will uh, take, take, take those words to heart. Can we give you a call, moderator? Yes, indeed. Oh, me. <laughs> Thank all of you. Uh, a special, a very special shout out to the Institute of, of Politics, Policy, Policy, Politics, and History. Thank you so much, all of you, for being a part of this wonderful, wonderful evening. Uh, look forward to future programming on, on behalf of IPPH. Uh, we are so excited to be a part of this community. It is so, so, so exciting to see so much of the community coming out and being excited for what's happening here at the University of the District of Columbia. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah.